Hello everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Something incredible just happened. Microsoft open-sourced the Windows subsystem for Linux. Yes, WSL is now fully open and on GitHub. But if you think this is just a win for developers using Windows, you're missing the bigger picture. This moment marks a historical shift, one that tells us how Microsoft, once the sworn enemy of open source, reinvented itself. To understand this fully, we need to go back. Back to a time when Microsoft saw Linux not just as competition, but as a disease. Yes, a disease. In the early 2000s, then-CEO Steve Ballmer made it clear, Linux is a cancer that attaches itself in an intellectual property sense to everything it touches. It wasn't just a quote, it was a battle cry. Microsoft saw the open source model as a direct threat to its empire built on proprietary software. Windows, Office, Exchange, Internet Explorer. Every part of the Microsoft ecosystem depended on lock-in. The company used classic FUD tactics, fear, uncertainty, and doubt as weapons against open source. And it wasn't just rhetoric. Microsoft funded studies and marketing campaigns to paint Linux as unreliable, insecure, and legally dangerous. One notorious example was the Get the Facts campaign in the early 2000s, a massive PR effort aimed at convincing businesses that Windows was cheaper and safer than Linux. They paid for reports claiming Linux had hidden costs, poor performance, and higher TCO, total cost of ownership. On the legal front, Microsoft frequently hinted at having over 200 patents that Linux allegedly infringed on, but never specified them. This created a chilling effect in the enterprise world, scaring companies away from adopting Linux. They also refused to adopt or support open standards like ODF, the open document format used by OpenOffice and later LibreOffice, because it challenged the dominance of Microsoft Office's proprietary formats. When governments like those of Massachusetts or some EU institutions tried to adopt ODF to escape vendor lock-in, Microsoft lobbied hard behind the scenes to reverse those decisions. And let's not forget their role in pushing software patent agreements with hardware vendors, effectively creating a tax on using Linux. For example, their deal with Novell in 2006, where Microsoft paid hundreds of millions, claiming it was for interoperability, but many saw it as an indirect way to legitimize their patent claims. This was the Microsoft of the gates Balmer era, powerful, aggressive, and paranoid. They believed in a future where Windows would run on every PC, every server, every device, even the Xbox was built on that vision. But here's the twist. That future never happened. The world changed, fast. The rise of the internet made the desktop less important. People didn't need Office installed. They could use Google Docs. They didn't need Internet Explorer. They had Firefox and Chrome. And they didn't need Windows because Linux was quietly taking over everything except the desktop. And then came mobile. Apple's iPhone revolutionized computing. Android, based on Linux, conquered the rest of the market. Microsoft tried to compete with Windows Phone and failed. They even bought Nokia only to shut it down later. The dream of Windows Everywhere collapsed. And along with it collapsed every attempt by Microsoft to dominate other markets with the same arrogant mentality. From the Zune, their failed iPod competitor, to the Windows media ecosystem, to the disastrous acquisition of Nokia and the launch of Windows Phone, these were failures on all fronts. Meanwhile, Linux was thriving on smartphones, servers, routers, smart TVs, and later the cloud. So when Satya Nadella took over in 2014, Microsoft was no longer the unstoppable giant. It was a legacy company trying to stay relevant. And Nadella made a bold choice, abandon the Windows-centric ideology, and embrace the future. That future was called Azure, Microsoft's cloud platform. And here's the irony. Azure runs more Linux than Windows, because developers chose Linux, because containers and Kubernetes run on Linux, because open source tools became the standard, Python, Node.js, Go, Java, all of them first-class citizens in the cloud. So Microsoft had to adapt. They didn't just tolerate open source, they became a part of it. Let's list a few milestones. They released .NET Core as open source. They acquired GitHub, the home of open source development. They released Visual Studio Code, a free open editor under a permissive license. They built the new Edge browser on Chromium instead of fighting Google's engine. They created the Windows Terminal, open sourced it, and even made Power Toys cool again. They partnered with Canonical to build Ubuntu images specifically tailored for Azure and WSL. 
Let's stop on that last one for a second. In 2016, the idea of Microsoft collaborating with Canonical, the company behind Ubuntu, would have sounded absurd. But that's exactly what happened. They built an official Ubuntu image for WSL. Later came Debian, Fedora, OpenSUSE. Microsoft didn't just allow them, they invited them. Why? Because developers wanted it. The open source shift wasn't ideological. It was practical. It was market driven. Microsoft realized it couldn't afford to be the bad guy anymore. WSL was a key part of this shift. When it launched in 2016, it used a compatibility layer, WSL1, that translated Linux system calls on the fly. It was limited, but useful. Then came WSL2 in 2019. This version ran a real Linux kernel in a lightweight virtual machine maintained by Microsoft. It supported full system calls, GUI Linux apps, GPU acceleration, and even systemd. But here's the thing. While you could use WSL, you couldn't really see how it worked. Most of the components were closed source, no transparency, no contribution, until now. In May 2025, Microsoft open sourced the main user mode components of WSL. The command line tools, wsl.exe, wslconfig.exe, and wslg.exe for GUI support. The Windows side service that manages Linux distributions, file systems, and virtual machines. The Linux daemons that handle networking, port forwarding, and shared folders. Even the Plan 9 server that powers file sharing between Windows and Linux. Some parts remain proprietary, like the legacy driver for WSL1. But the important parts, what modern WSL2 users rely on, are now public. Anyone can build them, fork them, or improve them. This isn't just good news for developers. It's a message. It says we're part of the open source ecosystem now, for real. But should we celebrate? Yes, but with caution. Because Microsoft is still a corporation, it still wants to dominate markets. GitHub Copilot, for example, is built on open code but monetized as a proprietary service. They use open source strategically, sometimes brilliantly. So yes, they play the open source game, but they still play their game. Yet the fact that they have to play it at all that's a sign of how much the world has changed. Open source didn't just survive, it became the infrastructure of modern computing. From smartphones to supercomputers, from smartwatches to cloud giants, Linux and open software are everywhere. And Microsoft? Microsoft learned to live with that. WSL becoming open source is not just a development update. It's the final proof that even the biggest, most closed software company in history had to bend to the will of open collaboration. What open source really means in 2025. Now that WSL is open source, some might say, great, Microsoft has changed. They get it now. But let's pause for a second, because what does open source really mean today? Open source was born as a philosophy of freedom, freedom to study, to modify, to share. It wasn't just about code. It was a rebellion against gatekeeping, a belief that knowledge and power should be distributed, not hoarded. But in 2025, open source is also infrastructure. It's used by every major corporation, every cloud provider, every AI model. And that raises a tough question. Can something be truly open when it's controlled by a trillion dollar company? When Microsoft open sources WSL, they still decide the roadmap. They still control the direction. Yes, you can contribute, but you're contributing to their platform under their rules. And that's fine. Let's be realistic. But let's not confuse source visibility with true freedom. True open source is community-led, not just open-coded. So the real challenge for the future isn't just to open software. It's to open governance, open infrastructure, and open decision-making. WSL going open source is a good step, but the journey toward real openness is far from over. Thanks for watching.